All right, hello everyone. This is Ralton Emery with SME. I serve as the member and industry relations manager overseeing our corporate membership program. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar featuring one of our corporate members, Machine Metrics. The webinar today is entitled The Manufacturing Analytics Journey. I'd like to review some housekeeping items as we begin. This webinar is a one hour webinar between 30 to 45 minutes of presentation and 15 minutes of Q&A. All attendee phones are muted upon entry of the webinar to cut down on background noise. This presentation is uh, being recorded for our membership later on and will be posted on our portals within eight to 10 business days. If you do have a question for our uh, presenter, during the presentation, please feel free to use either the chat or the Q&A function within WebEx, and we will ask that question and get an answer at the end of the presentation. If you are having any difficulties with audio or video uh, seeing the screen, please email me at rmery at sme.org, and we will try to get that rectified. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. And his name is Bill Byther from Machine Metrics, CEO of Machine Metrics and co-founder. He is an experienced software entrepreneur and uh, is founder of Atlas Soft, a software, an enterprise software company that was sold to Cofax, now Lexmark. Prior to that, he worked in aerospace engineering. I'd like to welcome Bill and turn over the controls to him. my screen so you can um, uh, you can see uh, my screen I don't think uh, Ralph and I oh there we go um, just give me just a moment okay so um, great well uh, good afternoon everyone or or good morning uh, if you aren't on the East Coast uh, again, uh, thank you, Ralton, for the opportunity to, to speak with everyone today. Uh, so the topic today is, um, is really about the journey of analytics in a manufacturing plant. Uh, what I'll be talking about is based on real life experiences that we've had applying our technology to our customers. Uh, before we do that, though, I just wanted to give a, a, just a brief inter introduction of, of machine metrics. Um, so machine metrics is the machine data component of the digital factory. We're an industrial IoT platform that's designed specifically for discrete manufacturing. Uh, so we developed a unique solution for manufacturers that really combines the extensibility of an IoT platform with the out-of-the-box capabilities of a packaged SaaS application. And with that, we can provide immediate and continuous value to our customers, manufacturers. So we're not your typical Silicon Valley type of startup. Uh, really, we've, uh, we've combined world-class talent from both uh, manufacturing and software to build a company that's focused on solving real manufacturing problems. Uh, we've been recognized by Forbes and uh, for the past few years, uh, the name Smart Manufacturing Product of the Year. And um, we are a Massachusetts-based company with, but with employees uh, based throughout the country. So uh, here's just an example. We have uh, over 100 customers worldwide um, that are really using our platform to measure and analyze the performance of, of many thousands of machines across their global factories. Our solutions are really providing these companies the necessary real-time data they need to optimize their machine performance and productivity. Uh, and with that, they can increase their capacity utilization and uh, ultimately just be more competitive and win more business. So the, despite manufacturing being the largest industry in the country, uh, we see that it produces the most amount of raw data, but has the least digitization of any other industry. Uh, so really what we see today is, is the internet moment for manufacturers, um, just like it was for the internet um, over 20 years ago. And uh, what, I, what I want to show you here is just what a, what a typical machine shop looks like before it's been digitized. Um, and really before our machine data has been captured. Uh, you can see that there's um, you know, sophisticated equipment, you have uh, you know, CNC machines, you have CMM systems, 
But the, the information from these machines that really exists on those machines is not being captured or aggregated in any way. Uh, now, in this case, um, from one of our customers, um, they, they were having a problem where at, at the end of every day, they, they would see a, a shortage of parts by around 20%. And it was really difficult to identify you know, why that was happening. So um, they really, it wasn't until they started capturing data that they could uh, really figure out that problem and resolve it. Um, and, uh, and that's, I'll get to that in, in a moment. So, um, so really, uh, machine metrics was, was started to solve a very big problem. Um, this number here is actual machine utilization data from our customers last year. And uh, it really demonstrates the, the opportunity for improvement uh, in our industry. And, uh, and this, uh, I guess, you know, lack of, of data really, I think, is driving this uh, low machine utilization. And, um, and again, this, this really, um, this is what we're focused on. Uh, we built our platform to improve utilization of equipment on, on the factory floor amongst our customers. And, uh, and really, um, you know, I'll be giving you some of the steps to, to help really um, bring you there. So the, um, the first step in really analytics journey is about the connectivity. It's really about capturing the data from your assets, from your equipment. And uh, it's been really difficult in, um, in, in our space, really, the machine data in particular comes in uh, many different ages, uh, different types of machines, makes and models, different controls. And uh, Cisco actually reports that 76% of industrial IoT projects fail. And we see that you could, you know, really from right from the start. The, the problem is just you know, capturing data from, from these machines. It's, uh, you know, it's time consuming, difficult, and, and prone to errors. So Machine Metrics has developed a connectivity solution that, that easily connects to virtually any machine, really whether it's new or old. And, um, but the, the second step, it isn't, doesn't just end there. The data that's collected needs to be transformed into a, a common data structure. Uh, for machines, we use a structure that you know, many of you should be familiar with uh, called MT Connect. But you know, for other you know, types of equipment, other industries, uh, there might be other open standards that need to be considered. So this, uh, this photo here is, <clears throat> is of a, a typical machine installation. Uh, basically, that, that little green box there is our edge device. Uh, it, uh, it connects to the machine's control just through a Ethernet port, but uh, also has the ability to uh, connect to additional sensors or relays, like you see in this uh, <clears throat> this machine here. The um, the information that's collected is sent to um, sent to the machine metrics cloud over an encrypted connection, and uh, this edge device acts as a firewall between the machine's control and internet. So there's no way that um, that you know anything can get to the machine. It's protected, and uh, you know, we can use various modes to communicate to the to the cloud. I mean, it's uh, cellular. Uh, we can use uh, Wi-Fi or, or network. And uh, it's easily configured with just uh, a, an application on your iPhone or Android phone. So now that we're collecting data from, from your shop floor and from your machines, uh, we can start really leveraging that data to, to drive value. Uh, the first step really doesn't give you much. So what, um, this is really where we're, we're going to be spending our time. So the, uh, it, an industrial IT installation um, really takes action from the data that it collects. And um, you know, every industry has its own sort of unique processes and capabilities. But we, we like to start with uh, descriptive analytics, which is really about understanding what's happening now and what's happened in the past. And then the next step is diagnostic analytics. You know, this is really going deep into the data and understand, understanding why problems are occurring. And then there's a predictive analytics, which is understanding what's likely to happen based on patterns in the data. And, uh, and then I guess the holy grail of prescriptive analytics, which is really recommendations to prevent those problems from occurring in the first place. And typically these steps occur sequentially. So we start with diagnostic analytics, or, I'm sorry, descriptive analytics. And um, descriptive analytics is, uh, is really the matter of displaying the right data to the right people so fast decisions can be made. And this increases transparency across the entire organization. Uh, so most tools or many tools that have data offer some level of descriptive analytics, displaying the data that's, that's being collected. And then you have business intelligence tools or BI tools that have been developed to really combine many data sets to, to display 
data right up to the executive level. So, you know, here's some examples of how machine metrics uh, really offers descriptive analytics. And, uh, you know, with, with some of our out of box reports, and, you know, what we found is that, that both manufacturers, both large and small, really have limited visibility into their production. Just displaying this data um, in real time can empower workers to meet their goals and really requiring limited oversight. And uh, it's much easier to, to change a shop culture from, you know, from being just reactive and finger pointing to being more data driven and creative when you have this information in real time visible to everyone. And, uh, you know, we found that uh, as long as you tie this against your performance KPIs, that uh, you can drive up performance by as much as 20%. And even for factories that have some visibility, um, that might be delayed a few hours. Um, just moving this to real-time data can be very measurable. You know, we see, you know, large automotive plants that um, that have, um, uh, you know, some some real-time visibility, but not, you know, but not visibility over the entire shift. Uh, we've seen improvements of, um, you know, a few percent, which equates to, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you know, in a given day or week. But um, so the in the case of the machine shop that we displayed earlier, when we added these dashboards, you can see on the, on the upper right, the real-time dashboard, um, this, uh, that actually ties your, your machine, uh, your actual performance of the machine for the job that it's running to the, the, the goals and the KPIs. Uh, we saw their output immediately increase 20%. And uh, it was identified that the issue was that, in, there was a few issues, but in the morning, the operators would, um, wouldn't really get their machine up and running right away. And, um, and it took a while for them to, to run at, at full output. I mean, simple things like, you know, grabbing a cup of coffee and cleaning their work area before starting the, starting the machine. So just a, a simple change um, really changed the, um, the impact or had a big impact on the, on the performance. And there's many other uh, use cases that all add up, add up to that 20% improvement. And uh, so the, um, what, there's, there's a, the next step beyond, besides just displaying the data, you know, it's, uh, it, it goes a long way, but you, it, it becomes, well, if you, if you continue to look at those dashboards, you might miss something. And having notifications that, that are sent out when, um, like, for example, if the machine is down or if it's, it's alarmed out, um, having notification that's sent right to your phone or, you know, to um, you know, wherever you might be at the given time really helps change behavior and allows factory workers to respond even faster to problems. I mean, the, uh, the reason why they're important is when you have um, a new dashboard that's off the shop floor, everybody's looking at it, but uh, it can be a novelty that, that wears off. So having those notifications can be really important, but it's also important that those notifications aren't uh, too intrusive. So you have to you know, be considerate as, as to who receives notifications and how often so that they're always actionable. Uh, we had uh, an example of, of one customer that um, they actually uh, didn't allow their own personal cell phones on the factory floor but they ended up buying these uh, really cheap uh, Kyocera Android phones, really lo uh, loud ringers, and they, they call it the hot potato. So that whenever the, um, the machine went down, if it's been down for, I think, a minute or two, the operators receive uh, you know, their, their phone that's assigned to the machine. They'll receive a, a, essentially a ring. And uh, if that hadn't been resolved in, uh, I think it was 10 or 15 minutes, their supervisor would receive that same ring. So it was really effective to respond to problems much faster. Uh, just by having these notifications. So the um, uh, the other uh, you know descriptive analytics doesn't really end at dashboards and notifications. So modern cloud-based systems that are permitted to use aggregated data uh, for you know mostly for benchmarking can be very informative. Uh, so our customers receive a benchmarking report every month that informs them how their machine utilization compares to others, and our customers are making real decisions with this data. Now, for example, we have a medical device, medical device manufacturer that found that they were performing in the top 10% of all other customers. And uh, they decided that uh, they would insource a lot of their work because their, their suppliers, they figured, probably weren't performing as well as them. Uh, and then we have, um, you know, on the contrary side, uh, I could tell you there's, there's a customer that we, uh, that we had recently who, um, you know, after their first month, they reported that they were in the bottom 25% of all of their customers. You know, kind of a wake up call. And uh, so instead of buying new equipment that they were slated to buy, they, they uh, focused on improving the use of their existing equipment, continuous improvement. And uh, just, in, just in a few months, they increased their performance to the top 40%. Uh, 
of all machine metrics customers. And, and uh, so benchmarking can be a very useful descriptive analytic. And, and really, very few companies have a data infrastructure and a data science team to, to pull that off. So the, um, another uh, note is that um, with all of the out-of-the-box capabilities, there's, um, uh, it's really not possible to serve every single need with out-of-the-box reports, for example. But as long as you have the data and a really good interface to that data, uh, we have uh, what are called uh, APIs, uh, there are some really great BI or business intelligence tools that, uh, that we can integrate with that will pull that data where you can essentially build your own dashboards and visuals. And uh, what you see here is an example of, of a dashboard that looks at um, the two shifts, um, that would be your first and second shift, uh, the machine performance. And uh, this was built in uh, just a few hours. Um, you know, this is actually in the war room, so it's not designed for shop floor consumption. It's more for management and, and executives. But, um, but it's, uh, what you can do with this data is pretty, and visualization tools are, are pretty endless. It's just, you need to be careful not to overwhelm your, your people with too many visuals. Um, like I said before, the novelty could wear off if that data is not actionable. But, uh, but imagine, I mean, you can take this data and pull it into other third-party systems, uh, quality systems, CM, uh, maintenance, CMMS, and uh, you know, HR, and really go beyond, the, you know, beyond just the use cases that Machine Metrics was designed for um, originally. And that's really the power of the platform. So we talked about you know, step one of, of the analytics journey, uh, descriptive analytics. Uh, let's dive into diagnostic analytics. Um, really, this is understanding why a problem actually occurred to begin with. And um, you know, these tools make it really easy to go very deep into the data to answer this question. Uh, sometimes information from other people are required. And uh, generally, to get deep diagnostics, you know, that's not something you're going to get from sort of uh, uh, you know, horizontal or generic uh, data visualization tools. Uh, here's an example of our uh, machine conditions diagnostic timeline. And essentially, this can be configured to show any data item from that machine. Uh, you can stream this in real time or go back in time. Um, you know, this is a case where, I mean, it's difficult to see here, but um, there was a new machine that was purchased and it actually had crashed. And um, you can see that in the data with the alarms and the, the, um, the green indicates at the top that the machine's a cycle and, and blue is idle. Um, but the operator didn't know what happened. So, so he ended up calling the service provider who, who was able to remotely pull up the data and pretty quickly identify that there was a change to the program that caused the crash. Essentially, the, uh, the program was, was edited and instead of looping back to the main program, they looped to the subprogram and, um, and that caused, uh, you know, pretty you know, decent amount of damage to the machine. So you know, this is a simple programming mistake, but you can imagine that there's a lot of other issues that you know, might be you know, reoccurrences of, of problems, and you can go back and, and really inspect that data to find out what went wrong. Another example of diagnostic analytics is, is here, uh, you, you don't always get all the information you need, in this case from the machine, so, so we can ask the operator to augment that machine data. You know, for example, when the machine is idle and there's no alarm, we don't always know why that machine is down. So we can ask the operator, well, why is this machine down? And then by presenting the list of downtime reasons you know, that uh, incorporate machine data with the operator data, uh, we can really understand why. You know, why did these machines not perform to, to expectation? And uh, this is delivered in a, in a simple Pareto chart. So the, the next step really is, uh, is around predictive analytics. And um, you know, I found a lot of companies like to jump here immediately. Uh, the, um, uh, the challenge here is that it takes a lot of time and effort to really gain value. And uh, the amount of time can be considerably more than descriptive and diagnostic analytics. To, to give you some examples of some predictive analytics, um, so it could be you know, not just around like machines, but you know, for example, your process. So when is your, your part or your job going to finish? You know, it's a prediction, right? You're, you're basing it off of more than just the cycle time, you're basing it off of other factors um, that, that could happen, you know, launches, breaks, uh, you know, pre uh, preventive maintenance, you know, all this data that's required to really be predictive. Um, and really this can lead into even, you know, bigger predictions like, you know, am I going to miss my delivery date? And, you know, a confidence factor, you know, I have an 80% chance of missing a delivery date, so we need to do something about it. And, um, and then when you tie this to, to actual, like, machines, I mean, we hear uh, predicted maintenance as a common term, you know, how long do I have before maintenance is required? 
you know, the, you know, the spindle drive is about to fail. Yeah, you know, we're, we're seeing in the data that, that uh, it looks like these are predictive indicators for failure. So the, um, but the, the challenge here is that if, um, especially in discrete manufacturing, in process manufacturing or discrete manufacturing that's isolated to a single system, like one motor, <clears throat> a pump, a compressor, um, there are some algorithms and tools that can detect this failure, you know, based on um, relatively simple, what we call um, thresholding. Um, and this is a, an example in our product where we set a threshold on an analog signal. Um, in this case, um, I'll give you an example. This is uh, an accelerometer that was installed on the bar feeder of a silicon lathe. And this was to detect bent bars. And uh, so we installed that sensor. And the thing is, we had to actually see a failure before we could set that threshold. So we waited until it failed. We went back through our diagnostic tools, figured out what that threshold was, set that threshold, and ran it again for a while. Then it failed again, and they were notified. So what, um, what this did, it, it provided that notification in just enough time to stop that, that machine before it caused all the tools to, to fail. So, you know, it really was a, was a high value uh, change. But the, the challenge with this, it's a pretty simple threshold, is that it has to be calibrated. And some things could change. Maybe it's a different tool or something else that could cause, the, cause this issue. So really, a, a supervised machine learning algorithm could be developed that, um, that would not require the human to set that threshold. But the challenge with that is it requires a lot of data. And often, we don't have that data to train an algorithm. So, you know, in this case, the, um, in order to you know, really do a great job on building out that algorithm, uh, we would need to hire a team of data scientists, uh, you know, an external um, sort of predictive analytics company to build an algorithm that's specific to, to this use case. And, uh, and that's the, the challenge with, with these algorithms that you're most, most of the time these use cases are very unique to you, the, the material that you're machining, um, the types of equipment that you have. But, um, but we have found that by opening up our platform to, to our customers and partners, you know, partners such as the, the machine tool builders that, uh, that had developed these algorithms, that, that, that this could actually be, uh, that this could extend our platform and uh, essentially use our capabilities to notify customers and, and uh, stream the data through this algorithm to actually, um, to, to actually detect these problems. So this is really the, the strategy that, that we've been using successfully is by partnering with others that have built out these, um, these specific algorithms. And, um, but uh, let me give you an example of where that we have applied machine learning to solve real problems uh, ourselves and across uh, and at scale across many, many customers. Uh, here's an example of a, a case where we detect an anomaly. So, we built a, um, basically it's a, it's a patented uh, unsupervised machine learning algorithm that all of our customers have access to that can detect anomalies. And uh, in this case, you can actually kind of see that there's a, a difference here. You can see those consistent part cycles. And then this one, the, the load and the position is different. And, um, and this triggered an anomaly that, um, that really was, um, uh, that, that was able to detect a problem before an operator could even notice. And uh, we had a recent case just a couple of weeks ago, the new customer, their, their German automotive supplier, that uh, just installed machine metrics and they, they, they enabled the anomaly detection. And they were getting a few anomalies. And uh, I think it was a day later, um, they, they had a, a tool holder failure. And uh, this tool holder failure caused a delay of, of many days. They, you know, they, were, um, they happened to be you know, outside of, of the US and, in um, South America, and you know, it took them a while for their their um, service provider to come in and fix the machine. And um, because of this anomaly detection, they ignored it the first time because it was new. Um, they they recognized that it actually detected the problem with tool holder, and uh, they reassured me that they would not be ignoring those um, those notifications again. Um, but this is one of of many examples of of uh, a predictive algorithm that that could be built to really identify problems ahead of time. And, uh, and again, it's not just based on machine failure, it could be based on your production, um, whatever data that you have that, that provides these deep insights into what might happen that can be, can be considered really a predictive analytic. So, so prescriptive analytics really is the final step in our analytics journey. Um, this is where the system becomes instructional. 
it is considered the holy grail of analytics. And uh, the reason is because it, it doesn't just predict what's happening, it actually informs the user on the optimal steps to complete a task efficiently. So, but in order to really offer prescriptive analytics, we need to understand the what, the descriptive analytics, the why, diagnostic, and, and the when, predictive, to really uh, define these instructions. And, uh, and this, is, um, this is really complicated. And, and it's actually an area where, where we're uh, really focused. And uh, it's, it's an area where there's um, continuous value to be had for many, many years. And, and really, we're, as an industry, we're, we're just barely scratching the surface around prescriptive analytics. Well, let me give you an example of what, what that might be. So, you know, one example is just understanding, okay, based on all the events that are upcoming, you know, what machine as an operator should I be near uh, that'll need my attention next and, you know, running the highest priority job. Um, another would be, and we've actually seen this um, in some of the very specific use cases, you know, based on inspection data, you know, when should I adjust the offsets and by how much? And uh, we've seen this with some robotics automation and some technology that's that's built specifically around this. So, you know, we are seeing some prescriptive analytics in this industry. And uh, another would be, you know, how do I perform, you know, preventive maintenance, you know, ahead of a, a spindle failure? And not only that, but here are the instructions on how to perform that maintenance. Uh, and some of these actually, you know, I can, um, I can show you how machine metrics is, is solving this. The other is, you know, an over travel arm occurs, what do I need to do? So, you know, here's just a quick example. Excuse me. Example of, of our preventive maintenance module, <coughs> and uh, this includes instructions. So, if the um, if the uh, that machine basically runs a certain amount of time, and you know based on the history, we can define how much you know, usage that machine requires prior to failure. Uh, we can start to really identify how long until that machine requires maintenance. And then if we have other you know, data that indicates uh, like an alarms or or a, you know, for example, if you really get sophisticated and install a, a like a current or vibration monitoring system that, you know, that's on a specific piece of equipment, like a, a, a bearing, like a ball bearing, uh, <laughs> that can be used to, to indicate that maintenance is due um, either through our system here or that can be sent to a, a third party maintenance system. So <clears throat> here's an example of our, um, um, I guess uh, we'll call this, I mean, it's a feature that's coming soon. So those on the phone are our customers, uh, please stay tuned for this. Essentially, we're, um, we have an operator touch screen um, that's on you know, thousands of machines. Uh, so we're extending the, the, um, the usage of these touch screens to include instructions. So, you know, for example, if that maintenance is due, um, you know, we, can, we show that instruction in the, in the UI, but having that right in front of the operator at the time that uh, that service is required uh, is very valuable. And here's a case where a machine is in an alarm, and that alarm requires uh, you know some steps to be taken to to clear up that alarm. Um, in this case, there's a, a clutch problem, and uh, you know we can see that by having those instructions right there, you know in the, in front of the operator, can can really be a game changer. You know, in, in this case, imagine that the operator is a third shift third shift operator, maybe new. Instead of waiting for the maintenance technician to come in the next day, you know, why not provide those instructions so that an operator knows how to perform that task? And uh, you don't, I mean, you don't necessarily need um, need to have a system to display this. It makes it much, uh, you know, much more effective. Um, but having that content available, you know, for your team is uh, is is really um, you know, can can be very uh, very effective, especially when you have uh, you know lesser skilled operators that are newer, replacing you know an aging workforce. Um, this can be very important and um, and uh, it produce a lot of additional value. So um, so with that, um, you know, I, I do say that this is, um, call it my very biased advice for those looking to dive into industrial IoT. Really, my recommendations are that um, that you pick a platform that will scale with you and a vendor that has a lot of experience in your vertical, in your industry. Um, it's really necessary to have that out of the box value, which you really need. You know, if you if you just if you choose a platform that um, that doesn't have that vertical integration, you're going to be developing systems and and for for months or maybe years before you really see value. Um, the other is you know don't get too caught up in AI, machine learning, predictive analytics. It's um, 
you know, it's really not uh, it's not good advice to try to leapfrog and skip steps along analytics journeys. I mean, you really want to start on descriptive and move your way through. Um, you know, in terms of how long to really gain value from it or to get through this journey, you know, some companies, you know, most companies are really at the beginning. They're at the descriptive phase, maybe getting into diagnostics. Very few are in the predictive, so, you know, don't feel that you know, you're behind. Um, you know, we're, we're really um, see that some companies can move faster than others, but, you know, again, most are really at the beginning. And, uh, but, you know, those, the results for those that are really committed to this journey is that uh, you'll have a business that is data-driven, more competitive, and more lean. And uh, you really be, you'd be considered a leader uh, among others on, along this journey. So, um, so with, that, with that said, it looks like I, I kept it to the, the half an hour that, uh, that I promised. Uh, I would uh, like to open it up to any questions. And you know, we have some time for questions, so uh, you know, please feel free to shoot them my way. Yes, thanks, Bill. Uh, a couple of questions. This is actually going to be a two-parter. Uh, the first one is, what can we do to ensure our shop floor is ready for the Industry 4.0? And then a second part that Graham actually answered in the chat, but I'd like you to expound on, is how do you collect data from legacy machines that aren't in C? Got it. Okay, so the first question, you know, what, what should I do to be ready for this transformation? Um, really, the you know what we've seen is one of the biggest challenges really is in the is in the IT infrastructure. Um, make sure that you have a good network. You know, not just I mean we I mean you can support wireless connectivity to your machines. If you do that, you need to have a really strong Wi-Fi. You know, or if you're going to go the route of um, you know of hardwired Ethernet, make sure you have good Ethernet and good switches and you know and, and think about security. You know, so a proper firewall and all that is is really necessary. The other is, um, is you really, uh, we've seen, you know, our customers that are unsuccessful, you know, they don't really have management buy-in or they don't have a champion. You really need a champion to, um, to really own this project and, um, and really get buy-in amongst the, yeah, amongst the, uh, the shop floor. Um, and once you do, as I said, the, the value is, um, you know, is, is pretty huge. So the, um, so the, the second question, Oh yeah, so, how, so connecting to legacy equipment. Uh, we spent a lot of time around that, making it really easy, as easy as it can be. The, um, you know, if you have newer controls, we can pull data right, uh, right from the control through an ethernet port. For legacy equipment, what we found is that, um, so we've, we've developed a, um, an IO module that, um, that can pull data through uh, either sensors or through relays and all that you really need to, you know, to drive, uh, to really monitor your production is understanding, you know, if the machine is running or not and uh, when that machine has produced a, a new piece. And uh, those two signals are relatively easy to obtain from the machine. Uh, sometimes those signals exist already or other times we'll install a sensor, like a current sensor or the spindle motor to obtain that. And uh, we have full instructions uh, through our knowledge base and how to do that yourself, or or we uh, we sometimes go on site and install um, at our customers directly. Excellent. Another question that's come in: What portion of your customers are in the latter stages of the four-stage analytics maturity cycle? You know, predictive or prescriptive? Yeah. So I mean, most of our customers are still at descriptive and diagnostic. I mean, we're seeing because we make it really easy to, for example, enable anomaly detection. You know, our, all our customers have access to that, and um, you know, and, and some are really benefiting from it. But um, and but we have, um, I would say that um, the, the larger customers are really starting to push the envelope on the predictive and prescriptive. You know, some of these are that you know, the you know, as the product matures, we've really you know, we we've taken those same steps. We started with descriptive, we've gone to diagnostic. You know, we're really focusing now more on delivering predictive and prescriptive. But it's uh, it's you know it's also it's new for the whole industry. So uh, so yeah, I would say I mean I don't have that number off the top of my head, but you know most of them are in the descriptive and, and diagnostic side of this journey. Excellent. And then another two-part question. The first part: uh, Can machine metrics be deployed on premises? Uh, and then the second part is: How long does it take to install? Right. So machine metrics is a cloud-only platform. So it is, um, and the reason is, uh, you know, is a fewfold. Uh, one is that, um, you know, costs actually are lower to, to try to, um, to build out a scalable 
internal infrastructure, managing all of this data and all the analytics is really expensive and you need a you know, full IT team, you need additional servers, and you know, updates are really difficult. So that's all managed in the cloud. And, uh, and the other is just the, um, uh, you know, it actually, is, there, there's a, a, I guess a, you know, an industry, um, I, I guess there's a, a part of the, the industry being a little bit laggard when it comes to cloud. The perception is that cloud is not secure, but in fact, it actually is more secure. And uh, you know, one example of that is, um, you know, people hear of, um, you know, an industrial, uh, uh, I guess, a security issue called Stuxnet. Stuxnet, and that was uh, that was where there was a, a virus that was actually in, you know, basically um, came into the Iranian nuclear plant. And the way that that actually happened was that um, it was an on-premise uh, security breach, where uh, these USB keys were dropped on the uh, parking lot of the um, of this nuclear plant and um, there's a uh, humans have this uh, this nature of curiosity so somebody picked up the key or maybe multiple people plugged it into their pc didn't have the latest updates and um, and caused a virus to to expand all the way into their um, into their ot or their their industrial machinery caused those machines to fail and uh, but by having that same software running on the cloud there's protections that would um, that would not allow you know anything to go on site, and you um, you have that barrier between your your on-premise uh, solution for edge device and the cloud. Excellent. This is uh, this next question is a business-specific question to Machine Metrics. Is it is there a proof of concept that can be uh, provided if if someone decides to implement your uh, your program? Yeah, we um, uh, we. We do have a say like um, we most of our customers will start with a smaller implementation, and uh, a proof of concept can be you know just uh, say you know ten machines for example, and uh, you know those can be run for a while so you can prove out value before you expand across your entire factory floor. So that's um, so yeah a lot of most of our co customers will start out in the proof of concept phase before they expand throughout their entire factory. Excellent. Well, thank you, Bill, for the presentation. It was excellent today. Again, thanks, everyone, for joining. If you have further questions, you can see Bill's information there. I'm sure that he would be glad to take them. Uh, this recording, again, will be available on SME Connect in 8 to 10 business days, and we would like to thank everyone for attending and look forward to more webinars coming up from SME membership in the future. Thank you, and this concludes today's webinar.